Good afternoon, good evening, uh, whatever the time is with you, you're very welcome to this uh, briefing for our highly valued agent partners in Eastern and, and Southern Africa. So we're talking to you this afternoon from UPIC, University of Plymouth International College, here in Plymouth in the southwest of England. So let me start with some introductions. Firstly of myself, I'm Tim Gutzel. I'm Director of Marketing and Admissions for UPIC, and then I'll hand over to my colleagues to introduce themselves and to my UPIC colleagues and then Nancy as well, if you'd like to introduce yourselves, please. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Toby Joseph Johnson. I'm the Student Experience Manager here at UPIC. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nico Staurenghi of the Admission Manager here at UPIC. Hello everyone, I'm Mary Yates and I'm the Admissions Coordinator here at UPIC. Hello, my name's Amber, I'm the Marketing and Student Recruitment Coordinator here at UPIC. Hi, um, my name is Nancy and I'm the SRM for Navitas. Great, thank you everybody. I can see we still have people joining, so I'll continue to admit people. Um, so let's show you the kind of agenda that we have for the next half an hour or so. So we've done the introductions. We'll introduce you to the team. Uh, we'll go through our entry requirements. So we've picked a couple of countries to give you examples. So um, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Tanzania. But if there are other countries you'd like to look at, we can very happily do that. We'll take you through our admissions process. It's not too late yet to apply for January. It's getting very tight on time, but we have intakes in May and September as well. And we'll take you all through the processes for that. We'll talk to you about our payment information, how to pay. Um, we'll try to demystify the CAS if that's a mystery to you. It won't be anymore after Mary and Nico have explained all of that. We'll go through the programs that we offer here at UPIC. So, our undergraduate foundation year one and pre-masters programs will give you some examples of student success stories. Um, talk about how we can support you with your marketing efforts through the collateral and the social media that we have. We'll share some important dates with you. So arrival dates, term dates, all of that kind of thing. Uh, we've got some great new facilities for health students that we'll uh, introduce you to. We'll talk about scholarships both UPIC scholarship awards and progression awards to our partner university, University of Plymouth. Uh, we'll take you on a drone tour of Plymouth, the city and the campus, so that you get an idea of how the place looks and feels, what it's like to live here, not just to study here. We'll talk to you about our accommodation offer, about all our different social media activities, at the end, we'll have an interactive Q&A. So we have some frequently asked questions that we typically go through. Um, but if you have questions as we're going through, then please do feel free to interrupt or to use the chat function. Um, and we will certainly leave time at the end if there are any more questions that you might have. So that's kind of how the next half an hour or so will look. Um, so let's get going. So uh, this is our team. So we've got Nancy there. She introduced herself, student recruitment manager. So she's closest to you based as she is in East Africa. But in the college here, you have um, various of these colleagues on the call. So I'm there as director of marketing and admissions. And then you have Amber, who is our marketing and student recruitment coordinator. You have representation from our student experience team through Toby, who's the student experience manager, and you have colleagues from our admissions team. So Nico and Mary, who lead the, the admissions team. Worth saying at this point, but we can offer a very fast turnaround time at the moment on applications. So uh, we should be able to turn around an application pretty much in 24 hours if you have any students who are who are keen to, to apply. So next, as I mentioned, we'll take a look at the entry requirements for Kenya, for Tanzania and Zimbabwe. 
if you're recruiting from other countries, then do please feel free to ask about our requirements for other countries. But this will give you an idea of what our typical kind of requirements are. So, um, Nico, would you like to take us through this? Of course. So we got three uh, level of entry for our program. Got foundation, first year, direct entry, and pre-master. And here we got, for example, for Kenya, for foundation, uh, we require completion of the KCSE, Kenya Certificate of Secondary Education, with at least five passes and the grade D average. Uh, for uh, Tanzania, uh, foundation successful completion of uh, the CSE with five subjects at C. And for Zimbabwe, the completion of the general certificate of education at ordinary level with five passes. In case your applicant is interested in uh, some specific program, we might require some good grade in specific subjects. For example, for computer science, they will need to have at least a C or above in maths. For health and human sciences program, we will need at least a C or above in math and the general science subjects. Uh, if they want to study engineering, robotics, we will need good grades, so at least a C in both maths and physics. Um, we have this information on the website, but also feel uh, feel free to to ask if uh, if it's not clear. With regard to the first year direct entry, uh, of course the requirements are uh, slightly higher. So, for example, in Kenya, uh, we require a KCSC with a minimum of four passes at grade C, and a minimum of B in mathematics. For Tanzania, uh, the uh, advanced certificate of secondary education, and in Zimbabwe. Uh, a or AS level or the Zimbabwe General Certificate of Education at advanced level. With regards to our pre-master, um, obviously one of the uh, qualifications acceptable is a bachelor degree or even a university level, which is equivalent to a UK h and higher national diploma. If, of course, their undergraduate degree are in a different subject compared to what they want to study at master level. In their personal statement, they will need to explain the reason for changing subject, changing the, the subject. With regards to the English requirement, uh, of course, we can accept the usual test like academic IELTS, but we got some uh, IELTS exemption for a few countries. For example, in Kenya, we can accept a great C or above in English in their KCSE. In same for Tanzania, so great C or above in English in the CSE. And in Zimbabwe, uh, again, great C or above in English in the GCE. GC. Of course, if a student submits uh, their KCSE and also a more recent IELTS, we tend usually to consider the IELTS as it's more recent. So just to uh, to keep in mind that if a student submit both uh, high school qualification and the IELTS, we will consider the most recent one in terms of English requirement. Great, hey, thank you, Nico. Um, and then the admissions process, would you like to go through that, Mary? Yeah, of course. So um, we're very flexible in the admissions team and we'll always consider all applications that come in. Um, and if there's a study gap, um, then we will require a CV um, that explains every single gap that they've got. Um, so there mustn't be any gaps in their CV and then a personal statement. And we will send the link for the personal statement, which is done online and comes directly to us. We need unique answers um, because if the study gap is a, a slightly longer one, we might need to ask our academic board to approve. That's a very quick process, but we must submit the full set of documents um, to give your student the best chance of getting um, through the application process. If there's been a previous visa refusal, um, please can you make sure that they do declare that on the application form um, and then 
we and if they've got the documents then if they could submit any previous um, refusal letters um, we will ask for an immigration history questionnaire which is a simple online form for that to, them to complete because again any previous visa refusals need to be um, considered by our academic board and as I said it's a very quick process and it's very fair but what we will do is always assess it on the documents that we are sent by the students if there's discrepancies on any documents, so per perhaps there's a, been a name change or a date of birth isn't quite right uh, across the documents, um, then we would need some sort of official document that um, would explain the discrepancy, so such as a marriage certificate um, or birth certificate or such like. Um, if you can send all communications through the Study Link agents portal rather than to our admissions inbox, it's really important for two reasons. Number one is it means that it will get processed much more quickly um, because we can tell that the documents are linked to that student, but also in terms of safety of students' um, documents and, and data. So make sure to send all your documents through the study link, please. Thanks, Mary. So next, payment information. Toby, you like talking about money, don't you? <laughs> Sometimes, Tim, sometimes. In regards to the payment information, as you can see on the screen, so if it's a pre-master's fees, um, it needs to be 100%. Um, if it's undergrad, it's at least 50% of the fees that are due. As a deposit, the remaining balance is, payment, pay, is due for the second semester of study. So if, you're, if you have any potential students that wants to join us in January, uh, their tuition deposit is 100% and their undergrad fee is 50%. The next installment will be due in March for the May semester. Um, we do offer some payment plans, but that's just on the second semester, a lot of fees up until the due date. Uh, the payment deadline for January, I believe is the, is that correct, 24th of November? Um, so very soon. So please get your applications in if you have any. Um, we also offer students, if they desire to, they can purchase our NAV insure policy, which is an extra bit of travel insurance uh, for the students uh, that covers some different kind of losses. Or you know, For more information, just feel free to drop an application. Um, in regards to the commission, yeah, we have commission payments at the end of each intake. Um, the 23-24 fees are below there. So foundation 15250, first year 16250. And like we said, the full deposit fee is 9,500 for the postgraduate um, study, which is the pre-masters. Thanks, Toby. Mary, Cass, demystified. Hopefully it's not a mystery. It certainly won't be a mystery in a minute or two from now. So hopefully um, we can lead you through the CAS process. Um, any um, requests for information from us are also always based on the fact we want your students to have the best chance of having the smoothest progress through their UK VI visa application. So once we've issued an unconditional offer, that offer will contain the provisional CAS with all the details that we think are correct and an acceptance form to be completed. We need that acceptance form um, accepted and also um, we need the student to make any amendments at this point um, because then we can make sure that the wording on the CAS later on is correct. If we've got a student under 18, um, then the acceptance form will also contain a box where we will need their parents' signatures and and information on their UK Guardian details. We do actually contact the UK Guardian to make sure that they're aware that they're being used as a guardian and to make sure that they do fulfil the criteria to make sure that they could offer support in the event of necessity. Um, for Also for under 18s, we need a birth certificate. So once we've received that and we're happy with that, we will send out a link to a precast checklist and that's a document uh, for the university which is asking very similar questions to things that we've asked before and it's just an online form which doesn't take long to complete but once we have that back we will then check that the details match and are up to date and we'll request a bank statement. Now the bank statement must um, contain enough money 
So currently that's £9,207, which is the UK living requ um, requirement, and the remaining first year study of, of that study fee. So for instance, if they paid 50% deposit, it would be the other 50% plus 9207 that amount must have been shown consistently for at least 28 days and the actual statement itself must end no more than 31 days before they apply for their visa. All right. They must include the contact details of the bank, um, which would be um, necessary for UKVI. So it's never us being difficult. We are simply following guidelines to make sure that the documents that are submitted to us could also be used for their visa application with as little chance of refusal as possible. OK, the bank statement must be in the student's name. The only accept um, exception to that is it could be in a parent's name or a legal guardian only. We can't accept business accounts and obviously UKVI, this is their guidance. If the statement isn't in the student's name, then we'd require a, a letter of financial consent and we can provide a document that is quite simple to edit and send back. And the student's birth certificate is also required because we need to check that the relationship is a legal relationship to the student. If the bank statement is fine, and generally they are, we'll raise the CAS here. Now that's the one benefit of being at UPIC is that in this office we have um, a sponsor license from the university um, and we're allowed to actually raise the CAS here. So as soon as we're ready, we can actually get on with that. Um, and then we request, we'll send you the CAS and we'll request that the student applies for their visa as soon as possible, as soon as they receive that CAS, because that means they can use all the documents that we've checked and should be okay. Um, we then want the students to let us know um, as soon as they've got their visa, because then Toby's team can pick up and make sure that we're there um, to answer any questions about enrolment, et cetera. I can see um, a question in the chat there, which um, is to do with this. So um, um, somebody, I think it's Amanda is asking, um, it's helpful for parents to make pay more of the first year tuition um, fees. Of course, that's absolutely fine. You can pay up to 100% of the um, first year fees for undergrad. Um, and so simply it would mean that they would need to show 9,207 plus anything remaining um, on their bank statement. Um, to answer is it possible to add more to the tuition payment after the deposit had been paid? There's a bit of difficulty here because what you've got to be careful of is that you're not taking money out of a bank account that you are using to show for visa purposes. So it's I can't answer more than generally here, um, but making sure that you're matching the bank statement with what we're showing on the CAS. We can um, alter CAS and add a sponsor note, but it's not advisable, which is why we say pay a certain amount, then get your bank statement, then apply for your visa. So if there are individual cases, then please do speak to us separately about that. I hope that answers yeah. that, Amanda. Yeah, thanks, Amanda, for that question. I mean, we've had students in the past from Zimbabwe, um, after they've received their cards, they've arrived in the UK and their parents have paid their second year fees as well. Um, after that point, um, I think what Mary's just trying to say, just for CAS purposes, please just keep it as simple as that. But once you've received your visa, and you're in the country. If they wanted to pay like two years worth of study, it's completely fine. Um, just because we are in partnership with the university, we can transfer any excess funds across to them. So not a problem. Great. Thank you, Toby. Thank you, Mary. Um, we should probably just pause there to see if there are any other questions on the CAS process, anything else about the admissions process or, or payments, any questions at this stage before we move on? Okay, let's move on. So let me tell you about the programs that we offer and the intake dates that we have. So the important number here is the number three because we have three levels of study. We have foundation and first year and pre-masters. And we have three intakes during the year in September and January and May. So everything that we offer is available in September. Most of what we offer is available in January. And May is mostly postgraduate pre-masters programs. 
leading directly into the master's programs that start in May at the university. The university also has a lot of January start master's programs now, so it could be possible to start a pre-master's program in September and start a master's in January with the university. So amongst the subjects that we have, a lot of things that you might expect to see, so business, computing, but also some things which are quite unusual and distinctive about UPIC and about our location. So we have, for example, the Health and Human Sciences Foundation program that leads into the university's nursing degrees and into lots of other degree programs which are allied to the health professions. So that Health and Human Sciences Foundation program is the one program that is a three semester program. All of the other undergraduate programs are two semesters. Uh, and that also requires a faculty interview. So an interview by a member of staff in the university just to ensure that the student knows what's involved in a nursing or physiotherapy career and that they're approaching that with the right kind of interest and motivation. Um, also worth noting that we have lots of programmes related to the kind of location of the university and the academic excellence that we have. So we are a coastal university and we're in the top five in the world for all things to do with marine uh, teaching and research. So we have programmes in marine, coast and ocean sciences, also, lots of things to do with the sea and business, so maritime business, uh, logistics, those kinds of programs. So our coastal location is is key here. Um, well, just one more thing to note about, and you probably do know this already, but worth pointing out that from January next year, postgraduate students will no longer be able to bring dependents with them. Um, so we know that's had some impact on some students' planning. So, yeah, those are the programmes that we offer. As we mentioned previously, the fees for the pre-masters start at £9,500, um, obviously slightly more for the foundation and first year programmes. You can see uh, we have uh, Nico, I think you've been answering the questions which are in the chat. So I think we're up to date with the questions. Thank you. So anything else about our um subject areas, our levels of study, our intake dates. Any questions on that before we move on? OK. Student success. Um, and this is really, really important to us. So I'm sure you will work with other pathway providers. What's different about Navitas? and about UPIC in particular, is that we want to admit students who will be successful. And by successful, that means completing the program with us and moving on to the university. It means graduating from the university. We fully respect that students don't particularly want to do a foundation program. They want to get onto the university's program. They want to graduate with a really good degree go home, have a great career, make a really good contribution to a family business. Um, so we know students don't really aspire to a programme with us, but it's something they need to do as a kind of link in the chain, a step along the way. So we really fully respect that. So for us, getting students to succeed is really important. And we're good at that. So we can now show, our data show that we have an equivalent number of first class and upper second class degrees awarded to students who've been through UPIC as are awarded to international direct entrance. We know that our students have equivalent module outcomes with the university as home and European Union and other overseas students. So we can genuinely show with data that we are adding value to the students who join UPIC and as you can see there, more than 85% progression from UPIC to the university, more than 85% successful completion of the, of the university degree. So we understand, we respect what motivates students and we're here to help them succeed, not just take their fees, not worry about what happens. We're all about student success. That's, that's really important to us here. 
Amber, do you want to say a little bit about how we can support our colleagues' marketing efforts? Oh, yeah, of course, Tim. So marketing, absolutely. We do have posters and banners at the moment. So do have a look at what you currently have. And if you'd like anything new or anything extra, then let me know. Um, also, we can do things like make flyers for you. So we can promote different events or different things that you have coming up. So, of course, you've got like open days and education fairs. I'm also trying to branch out into more videos as well um, of student success stories. Um, this is Sarah. She's brilliant. She's She was on our student council and she's also in our recent video that we released. So, yeah, have a little think about what you already have and what you may want. Um, and, yeah, just let me know. Thanks. Thank you, Amber. Toby, you like a date, don't you? I do like a date. I like money. I like dates. Oh, Tim, you're, you're selling me differently now. <laughs> um, in regards to the important dates uh, for our upcoming intake, January and May. Um, so as you can see, the last, um, the latest enrollment dates for undergrad and postgrad uh, vary 2nd and 2nd of Feb and the 22nd of January. The difference in the dates is because of the length of studies, understandably. The undergraduate program is a lot longer because they're here for two semesters, whereas the postgrad is only for one semester. So we want them here as as, as, as early as possible. Enrollment starts on the 15th of Jan with teaching starting the week after. And also in regards to CAS issuance, as you can see, the latest deadline is for the 15th of December. So ideally, we really want to try and get those applications in. That's for priority, but standard applications by the 1st of December. Uh, payment deadlines are both the 24th of November, so in three days' time. Um, app deadlines were still open at the moment, so you can you can still put in applications. So not to worry about the 10th of November there. You can ignore those dates at the bottom. Uh, for May, we are still taking applications right now up until the 15th of March and the 12th of April. Payment deadlines, as you can see there. Cash issuance, we want to work from the standard before we priority because we want to be working in advance but if you have anybody that has everything ready to go obviously you can work to the 19th of april dates um, enrollment starts on the 7th of may and the 13th subsequently and also the teaching starts just a week after the enrollment dates with your latest enrollments being from the 24th or the 20th of may next year thanks toby and um, just a couple of things to emphasize on that so um, we set these deadlines and it's not we don't do that to make things difficult for you or to put up barriers our reason for having these deadlines is so that we can get everything organized to issue the CAS in time for the student to be able to join us successfully um, if there is any flexibility we can offer around this then we will um, just ask us but that's our kind of golden rule so what we can't have happen is that somebody pays us and then we don't have time to get the CAS out that would be a nightmare. So these really are, they're more guidelines than, than deadlines um, because we want everyone to have a, a positive and a stress-free experience and, and to get everything organized in good time. Um, so yeah, if you do need a bit of flexibility around that, then so but yeah, please do just let us know and we'll do what we can to help. Um, the other thing that I would say on that is please do encourage your students to get here. Um, for the start of enrollment, we have a, a week, um, a week of induction activities, which are all really useful for new students to help them kind of hit the ground running and feel part of the community and the city before they start doing their assessed work. It's so much easier to arrive for the start of enrollment or certainly the start of teaching. Um, you're always trying to play catch up if you arrive once teaching has started. Um, we can allow that to some extent for undergraduate students, um, but for postgraduate students, the pre-masters, there's only 10 weeks of teaching on that course. So we do stick to that deadline of the first day of teaching for the pre-masters being the last enrollment date. Any questions on anything else so far? I can see if you have been answered in the chat. Um, but yeah, let's move on. Um, Mary, would you like to talk about this? Because I didn't actually have the chance to visit, but I know that you did. 
So this is something extra and something new that we just wanted to share. Um, just behind our building, which you'll be able to see in a minute on the drone tour, um, they've just opened the new facilities, the Health and Human Science um, building. And it is state of the art, some incredible technology over there. Um, and we were lucky enough to be invited to have a really good look around the building um, and see these facilities firsthand. So there's um, on the bottom left of the picture, you'll see um, it's basically a giant computer screen table, um, which is interactive and the students can zoom in on parts of the body. They can do research on there. It's an absolutely amazing piece of technology and they've got more than one of those over there. Um, one of the benefits of having this building specific for all the health programs is that all of the resources are there on hand so um, the uh, lecturers were saying that how great it is that they don't have to book um, resources beforehand. They can just know that during a session, if they need to get their hands on a piece of equipment to demonstrate or to go over some information, then it's all there on site for them. Um, there are wards set up so that students can get an idea of what a hospital ward might look like. There are specific facilities for um, for instance, podiatry, so um, looking at feet um, and there's specific chairs and lots of information and lots of resources specific to those courses. There's also um, um, sort of some simulation um, scenes set up so that students would go in and they'd have to respond to an emergency, say, um, and the scene is set up for them to respond to. So it's a brilliant state of the art facility, um, which is um, available to our students who are on those courses. So that was an extra we wanted to just show you started this year. Thank you, Mary. Oh, it's back to money again. So that must be Toby again. Yes, but this is money that goes back to the students, <laughs> which is fantastic. So as you can see, uh, we've got some scholarship opportunities available. Um, I think we still do uh, for the college for any in-app applications, do we, Tim? Just to correct me, I think we have a £1,000 for yeah. any potential applicants um, at the moment that make payment before the deadline. So please get those applications in. Um, those are just for undergrad, not postgrad, just to, to, to be aware. Um, in regards to um, progression scholarships, because this is what we're talking about, um, there are certain faculties that this applies to. Um, there's a list that's available on the university website where essentially any student that finishes or completes either a foundation first year, so going directly into the university or a pre-master's going directly into the university, has the potential to earn up to £2,000 off their subsequent tuition fee. Um, at the university so as long as to do that they need to have attendance over 85 percent they need to achieve at least a 70 percent grade on every module and they should hopefully be granted that two thousand pound scholarship of the university's fees um, students are also eligible um, to apply for an academic excellence scholarship uh, which takes 50% um, off their tuition fees for the next year understandably they need to have quite very good grades and almost have a good profile of you know relevant work experience uh to qualify for this but we had a student uh who left UPIC you know in last year and progressed to the university and got 50 percent off the tuition fee so it's nice to know that that's available it's not just about the starting initial sale uh, which is that thousand pounds off but how are the students are able to afford the next subsequent years thanks Toby yeah I think that is very unusual and very positive about the University of Plymouth Scholarship Awards that they can continue through each year of study. So, for example, that International Academic Excellence Scholarship is a remarkable award, really, because it can be 50% off the tuition fee for each year of study, as long as the grades are maintained. So, yeah, lots of scholarship awards. Um, we're never going to be able to make it financially possible for people who have no money, but we can make it easier for, for some people to join us and to, and to go through their study program. Toby, we're on to the drone tour now. So would you like me to stop sharing? Are you yes. going to fly today? Have you got your crash helmet ready? Yeah, no crashing here, no crashing, smooth sailing. Excellent. So what we're going to do now is give you a kind of virtual tour of Plymouth, of the campus, 
of the city. We'll show you how close the city is to the waterfront, give you an idea of where the accommodation is in relation to the university campus, to show you what a, a really convenient, student-friendly city Plymouth is. Here we go. I think we have liftoff. You see my screen? Yeah, we go. Yep. Fantastic. Um, at the moment, so we're, we're hovering right above the university campus right now. Um, and um, I believe the six of us, oh, actually, apologies, the five of us are located in this building right here on campus. So this is the college premises, uh, right opposite the train station, um, very central to the city and the campus itself. And all the um, buildings you can see that are highlighted in red are potentially different university facilities right across the city. Um, if I come over here to Plymouth Hall, uh, which is quite a popular destination for the city, as you can imagine, because it's got that amazing view of the ocean. Um, it's also called Britain's Ocean City, Plymouth itself, um, home to loads of um, ferry activities so there's ferries that come from you know Roscoff and Santander so from Spain and France quite frequently so it's got hospitality uh, features here at the, uh, at the city um, it's also got beautiful um, nature reserve further north um, Mary Nico I think you both have come up to the hole quite often haven't you what do you think uh yeah, no, it's a it's a unique view. It's very uh, close to where where we work and where the student can study. So they can use it also for their lunch break, their break to, uh, between the lessons. Um, so yeah, no, it's definitely it's definitely worth it. And everything you can and see I'm here is in really easy walking distance. So from the waterfront through the city centre to the university campus, which is right in the heart of the city, all of that is 10, 15 minutes walk at most. Sorry, Toby, to interrupt. No, 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 it's all right. I was just going to say, um, ask Amber how, how she enjoyed having lunch here at Royal William Yard and what it's about. Oh, I eat lunch there a lot of the time, to be honest. There's lots of really great places to go. Um, we got, yeah, different kind of um, different kind of restaurants too. So yeah, I won't go because once I start, I won't be able to stop. But thanks for thanks for asking, Toby. You're welcome. So yes, yeah, so what we're just trying to say, it's a really beautiful um, city, but also, you know, it's, it's quite ideal to have a city that's, you know, very close to all the amenities that the students require so accommodation quite flexible and quite close to the university itself uh, city center campus so that keeps transportation costs low a really safe city um, a city that has a very strong international presence and growing international community i think it's very important uh, so we have people from different nationalities quite a few growing um, East African communities as well with loads of restaurants, supermarkets available to students. Um, we try and sell the university and ourselves as, you know, very community focused. So we know our students quite personably. Um, here in the student experience team, we develop very good relationships with our students. So understandably, the parents tend to be the main sponsors and they want to know that their kids are doing okay and studying and we give a we keep a quite a comprehensive um, outlook on how their students are performing and attendance levels, safety levels. You know what kind of activities they're doing, what, what are they benefiting from the course, and how, how the city and the college is helping them grow and um, you know transfer across to the university itself. Um, I just come down here to the students' union. Uh, which is home to over 300 clubs and societies. Um, students have joined various facilities, um, societies on campus as well. Um, as you can see, there's, I don't know whether you can read that, but there's sports, there's so much available to students, um, Hogwarts Society, um, various um, you know interests that any student may have. They can even form their own society. We also have sabbatical offices um, that are elected each academic year so our students are eligible for doing so um got the su shop at the top here um in this building here we've got the library and there's also the student hub um, where students can book you know meetings with the well-being team 
They can use the 24 hour computer access area. Loads available. Um, and all our students can benefit from all the facilities that are available at the university. So as we said, one CAS uh, for both UPIC as well as the university, but also they can benefit from all the facilities right from year zero, which is the foundation program. Thanks, Toby. We're not London. It's really important to point that out. But I think there are so many positives that you can promote to your students about our not being in London. Um, clean air. That's a very real issue. It's a, There's a quality of life here being next to the sea and next to the countryside, which you don't find in big cities. Cost. So our typical accommodation might be around a half of typical London costs. And there's plenty of accommodation available or very close to the campus. Um, safety. So it's a very uh, highly ranked um, city in terms of having a low crime rate. So it feels like a safe place to be. Just looking at the view here, you can see the train station and the coach station, which are both right next to the college. So if your students do arrive in London, it's a, a three and a half hour train journey, but then just a two minute walk from the train station or the coach station to reach the college which is right on the edge of the university campus that you can see there. So it's a very student friendly city with the university at the heart of the city, uh, both literally and metaphorically. It's a large part of the university community and the city values international students very highly. Thank you, Tim. I'll land the drone now and we can carry on with the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, where's it gone? There we are. Accommodation. I started talking about that there, but um, yeah, all very close to the university campus and the college. So no need for public transport or to have a car or even a bicycle. Everything is a very short walking distance. Um, we work with a particular letting agency called Clever. Uh, your students are welcome to apply through them. They don't have to, obviously, um, but they can be more flexible on length of contract. So recognizing that students might arrive around any of our intake points. So they can offer shorter or longer contracts according to what a student needs. And then, yeah, what I was saying about quality of life, it's a top 10. UK Green University, only the second university in the UK uh, to go to carbon neutral. So that's a fantastic achievement. Top five UK young universities. So ranked in the top five of all universities in the UK, uh, which are less than 50 years old. So accommodation is a real major advantage. And as I said, could be around a half of typical London accommodation costs. Social media channel. Yes. I was also just going to point out there, Tim, we were voted the number one best place to live in England last year, um, according to the Total Jobs Quality of Living Index. Actually, that was earlier this year. So that's something just to keep in mind. But yeah, social media, we really do use as, as much as we can. Instagram is one of our favourites. So we do try to tell the students everything about what is going on on campus. We want to make sure they feel at home here as soon as possible. They make lots of friends. And also in terms of their studying, um, we send out lots of updates via email. Um, but yeah, also Instagram, Facebook, we use um, YouTube as well and LinkedIn. So yeah, and if you want to do any collabs or if you want us to promote anything or get involved, then just let us know. Thank you, Amber. I'll pause again. So are there any more questions about our location or anything else we've, we've spoken about or our use of social media? Um, just on that, um, there's lots of videos on our YouTube channel. Um, we're recording this session, so we'll post it on the YouTube channel as well so that you have a chance to, to go back and look at it, but also all kinds of student testimonials and other videos on there. So, yeah, lots and lots of social media presence now. Oh, and now we're on to frequently asked questions, which is great because we get to try and catch each other out as a UPIC staff team. We could also try and catch Nancy out, couldn't we? So, um Nico, is there an option to study online? 
Uh, no, there is an hour lesson or all face to face. The only exception is in case your um, applicant need a precessional English program, uh, which are usually available in summer. Some of them might be available online, but other than that, all our uh, courses, all our lessons are um, taught here in the college in person. So there is no option to study online. Thanks, Nico. Mary, what if a student has a study gap? Is there okay. a limit to how many years we can consider? No, there's no limit. We're, we're just quite happy to um, base our um, assessment of all applications fairly. So again, as I said before, if a student has a study gap, if they can please submit a CV, which explains all of their activities, their employment um, and any other education that they've had all the way up to present day with no gaps. Um, and we would request a personal statement as well to explain why they're wanting to return to study, particularly now. Why do they think it's a good time? Um, and then we can consider that if it's a particularly lengthy study gap, it would be considered by our academic board, which is a very quick process and again, very fair. So we welcome all applications um, from all applicants. Thank you very much, Mary. I'll ask myself the next question, to be fair. So can students book accommodation outside of Plymouth? Um, we, we showed you that there is lots of accommodation available in the city um, and much of it in very close walking distance. It's not an absolute requirement that students live in Plymouth, but we do say that they need to live within an easily commutable distance. So that means they need to be able to get here comfortably by nine o'clock in the morning when the first class would start. They need to be able to get home after five o'clock in the afternoon when the last class would end. So um, there is no option to study online, as we said before, they do need to be within easy reach of Plymouth. So not necessarily Plymouth itself, but within an easily commutable distance. Do students have to attend class every day, Toby? Absolutely. Um, I think if you've paid for something, you should attend <laughs> everything that you've paid for. Um, in regards to the classes, but I, I think students should attend the university itself so you can use all the facilities and resources available to you. Um, so, yeah, and as we mentioned before, there is um, an element of the progression scholarship, which is the 85% plus attendance. So there can be a real kind of financial incentive to attend. Not that that's the main reason for doing so, as Toby said, students have paid a lot of money for this opportunity so we certainly encourage them to get full value for that by attending as much as possible it's not all day every day so as i said there will be classes as early as nine o'clock in the morning as late as four o'clock in the afternoon but not all day every day um can students pay their fees in installments well that's something we've covered before so um for uh, before we issue the CAS, we require at least 50% deposit payment for undergraduate programmes and the full payment for the pre-masters programme. But then, Toby, what about the balance once we're here? How does that get paid? Um, so the balance um, can be paid in a week nine of that current semester for the next upcoming semester. So if they're joining in, Jan in January, their next semester fees will be due in March uh, for the May semester. If they're joining in May, the next semester fees uh, for this progressing September semester would be due in July. Thanks, Toby. Amber, are there any opportunities for part-time work? Yes, there are, Tim. Up to 20 hours a week as a student, you can work. And being in the city, there are quite a few different kinds of jobs you can do. So retail, hospitality, anything around that area. But yeah, don't be thinking you can get a job to support yourself in terms of paying your fees, because I'm, I'm afraid that wouldn't work that way. So yeah. Great, thank you very much. Um, we've gone through those questions because we find that sort of half a dozen questions there are often asked. So, and it's really important for your students to know. Um, I know we've moved sort of through and out of the COVID stage when there were options to study online. Important to remember that it's now all on campus here in Plymouth. Um, and that we can be flexible around accommodation. So I know lots of colleges and universities will have an absolute limit on study gap, which might be as short as two or three years. But 
we'll try and look at each application on an individual basis. We'll look at the whole candidate and their CV. Um, yeah, so those are our frequently asked questions, but I'll pause again to give you the option, the opportunity, sorry, to ask any questions which you may have. Or Nancy, is there anything you would like to add that we've overlooked? Hi, team. I think you guys have covered everything. And I think the counselors and the agents are happy unless, you know, maybe they can ask questions maybe after they can ask me, you know, on the WhatsApp group if they need more clarification. Yeah, sure. And you have our contact details there that I've just put up on the screen. Um, I think you have Nancy's number because she's been talking to you about this session through WhatsApp. Um, but you have all of our email addresses. So me and Toby and the admissions team, Nico and Mary um, and Amber for marketing and student recruitment issues. So we're a small team here. There's not that many of us. So um, don't feel worried that you have to get the email address right or you won't get a reply use any of those and if we're not the right person to answer we'll just share it with one of our colleagues always always happy to help so any final questions before we wrap up okay well, if there are no more questions, I'll end by saying a thank you to all of the people who've attended today. It's great to have uh, a really good turnout, so many colleagues from so many agencies. So thank you very much for your time and your attention. Um, let me say thank you as well to my UPIC colleagues for their inputs today, to Toby, to Mary, to Nico, to Amber. Um, thanks uh, to, to Nancy for helping set up the session and for joining us as well. So please do reach out if there are any questions you think of um, after the session. Also, as I said before, we have been recording this. Uh, so I will share the recording as soon as it's available to me. And also we will post it on our YouTube channel. So I'll do a countdown for any last questions before I hit the end button. Five, four, three, two one thanks everybody have a great day thanks team bye thank you bye